Shuba, that was a fantastic session and uh, I'm already hearing the vibes from uh, most of the participants who are absolutely delighted with uh, what they've heard and what they've seen. Um, coming back to you, um, it's a great idea. Why a kidney and not something else? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Gabriel. I think what resonated with me, the kidney, is it is a, an organ that has such a long waiting list. Uh, in the U.S., there's about a, over 100,000 people waiting and less than 20,000 transplants done. And it doesn't look like the numbers are going up, at least in terms of donor organs. So this is a challenge that we had to take on. And we felt the technology was available. Um, I mean, it's great. You've got a model of uh, the, the way the kidney is going to, to look like. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty significant miniaturization from your big dialysis machine to a tiny device that you can, you can implant. Um, what do you think one of the main challenges do you think was miniaturization or the biology part of the, con yeah. of the concept? Sure. So obviously this is a plastic model and we think this will be about the right size. The issue with um, implantable devices, as you know, is that you have to have a size that's manageable. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a device that are implanted, for example, a pacemaker, a defibrillator, the power supply is huge. In fact, two thirds of the pacemaker mm -hmm. can is the battery. So one of the things we had to do was how do we miniaturize it? Could we get rid of the power supply? So a lot of our efforts were directed towards coming up with a technology that could eliminate the need for a battery. Hence, we spent a lot of effort on the membrane technology and a membrane that would operate just based on perfusion pressure. So clearly the biology mm -hmm. is not trivial, but without having a mechanically viable membrane that could operate off perfusion pressure, we probably would not have this possible. I mean, th this is really fantastic because uh, my understanding from what you're saying is obviously that's implantable, but uh, and you've got a, a number of cells in there. I mean, one of the questions from the audience was what sort of cells you use to populate the device. And of course, you know, some of the stem cells or precursor cells may have a malignant potential. Is there any risk of that yeah. developing? It's an excellent question. And I think the way I think about it is my colleague David Humes used cadaver primary tubule cells. Now that's challenging. He has fig he figured out protocols to isolate and expand them. They still work to be done. Mm -hmm. But the exciting advancements with stem cells are also promising because that could potentially be unlimited supply. But you bring <coughs> up a good point, teratomas for example. However, the idea being that if we can keep the cells encased, protected, immunoisolated, you would likely mm -hmm. minimize the chances of them becoming prolif proliferative outside the device. So what would be the lifespan of the, of the cells in the device? Would you need, I mean, obviously it's implanted. It'll be rather difficult to go and change the cell compartment. Uh, it's a great question. And uh, we, obviously, this is all speculation at this stage. But what we can say is the following. So in our lab, we've kept the cells alive in culture for two months in the technology basis we're using. My colleague David kept them alive uh, for about four to six months, depending which study, in the, during the mm -hmm. clinical study. But... The way I like to think about it is maybe there's an engineering solution. So cells do die or cells stop functioning. How about the idea of having a minimally invasive port to replace the cells? And maybe that's the way to think about it. So in the engineering domain, we are thinking about ways to create ports so you could replenish or refresh the cells. I mean, that's, that that will be the future. And I think clearly um, um, we've heard about implantable or wearable devices. Where do you think the future is? Do you yeah. think the future will be this will take over and kidney transplantation with human biology will just go out of the window? <laughs> no, if only. No, I think the way to think about it is, you know, we have two million people who have kidney failure in the world, right? So we've got l lots of exciting research going on. On the one hand, we've got portable mm -hmm. dialysis machines, and then we have organ culture being grown. In between, we've got people who are trying to do 3D printing, we have people who are making wearable dialysis, and somewhere be beyond the wearable dialysis, but probably before a 3D printing, is something like ours. I do not think that will ever replace the need for or donor organs. I think using an engineering perspective will probably provide more function mm -hmm than dialysis, but probably not everything a transplant does. So the goal is, if we can get people off dialysis, we'll improve their outcomes, we'll decrease their morbidity, and if we achieve that, that will in itself will be substantial. Fantastic. Shiva, thank you very much for that. It was fantastic and uh, great talk today. Thank a you. A pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>